Hey everyone, welcome to San Ramon, Dublin, online, wherever you're joining us from. My name is Samuel Laws, and I have the honor of serving as our lead pastor here at Brave Church. And, you know, last Sunday, my dad, Pastor Darren, he delivered a teaching called It Starts With Me on how to experience personal revival. Uh, By the way, if you didn't know it, uh, Pastor Darren is my dad. Okay, I was talking to someone this last week, and they mentioned how awesome his teaching was, and and I forgot what else we were talking about, but then I was like referring to him as my dad, and they were like, what? He's your dad? And so, hey, if you're new around here, that was my dad. We don't look anything alike. He's like 6'3", light hair. I'm 5'6", dark hair. I I didn't get a lot of his features, uh, but I did get a lot from him. Uh, One of our core values is authentic honor, and we really don't need a reason to honor people. But while we're talking about my dad, I just want to say this, uh, since we're on the subject, you know, many of you are new around here. And so you might not know this. Um, You might be new to the team, uh, if you're on Team Brave or or just attending or wherever you're coming from. But uh, listen, I learned more from my dad than anyone else. And Brave Church wouldn't exist without him. Okay, we've been working together for a decade now. We moved here uh, to start this church together. And our church has continued to be so blessed by his leadership. From, from overseeing the schools, establishing systems, he just started coaching our campus pastors, and of course teaching on Sundays, and so much more. So hey, today we're going to continue what he talked about last week. Uh, we weren't really planning on it, but it resonated with so many people, this idea of personal revival, that it starts with me that the big things that God wants to revive in your life and change in your life, they start with what you're willing to take responsibility for and what you're willing to do in your own life. And so we're going to do a part two of this message, and we're going to talk about calling. Because it starts with me. But what is the it that me is supposed to be doing with my life? Okay, Mark Twain, he said this, the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. Everyone has a purpose that they were created for. Everyone has a calling. And everyone has questions about their calling throughout their lives. That's one of the interesting things about life and calling is that from one season into another, your calling can change. What you're, what you're supposed to be focused on or doing or what God leads you to might not always look the same. A calling is a powerful force. It drives our lives. It connects us to the very things that we've been put on this earth to do. But as we talk about this, we need to acknowledge that there are many different philosophies out there on how we find purpose, uh, how life finds meaning, how people get connected to something bigger than themselves. And so one of the things that we love and feel really honored by here at Brave is that every Sunday, There are people who join us, whether online or in person on campus. And and there are people that are coming from all different backgrounds that believe in different things or aren't sure what they believe. They're seeking. And we find it an honor that you feel safe and comfortable enough to explore faith with us. Everything we do here is about helping people find and follow Jesus. And so that's what we place our trust in. We follow Jesus There's no smoke and mirrors. Okay, this isn't a cult. Uh, You know, one of the characteristics, I was was reading this article the other day, one of the characteristics of a cult is actually cutting people off from outside knowledge, from outside thinking and ideas of their, from their sect or their cult, or their, you know, they don't call it a cult usually, but their group. And so discussing uh, things, exploring things is, 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 is totally opposite of what the church is all about. That's not who we are here at Brave. We're not afraid of questions. In fact, we believe the truth can handle our questions. And so if you have a Bible, you can go to 1 Timothy 4, where we find three principles of calling. And that's what we're going to look at today. But before we talk about the principles of calling, I think it's important to look at three philosophies of purpose that are informing how we all think and approach this concept of having a life calling. And so in your notes, you can write this down, three philosophies of purpose. And the first is this, the Eastern answer. The Eastern answer, which includes Hinduism and Buddhism. This involves pursuing various states of detachment because we're believed to be caught in a world of illusion. Therefore, we seek freedom to to be an individual through detachment and renunciation of yourself. And this becomes the answer. So the way of Jesus is to embody him and his presence, to, to embody the incarnate presence of Jesus. And this is the opposite 
of what the Eastern answer is all about. That answer is all about detaching from ourselves, detaching and embodying nothing. Okay, the second approach is the secular answer. This includes atheism, uh, most agnostics, naturalists in science, a very large number of humanists. Okay, this path means that you have to decide your path and purpose yourself. Okay, because it's something that you need to figure out. You need to accomplish it. You need to chart your own course. If final reality is all left up to chance and there is no God to consider, then your purpose is up to you and you need to decide it and you need to achieve it yourself. In other words, you don't discover your purpose. You decide it and you make it happen. You carry it on your shoulders. Your life, your world, it's what you make it for better or worse. Now, I think this is one of the many uh, tra traps that we fall into as Western people, even, even after following Jesus, because we feel tempted to slip back into the pop culture mantras of, of hustle and make things happen. I mean, the culture we live in is immersed in this thinking. Career is a choice. Where you live is a choice. Gender is a choice. Everything is a choice. And it's not that God doesn't give us choices, but when it comes to calling, it's not a choice or a choose your own adventure and then inform God of what you decided. It's a discovery of what he has planned for us. So, so lastly, we get to the biblical answer. This path to purpose believes that the one who created you is the most capable person to call you to a purpose for your life. He is the best person to help you discover who you really are. He alone knows what you were created to do. The scriptures teach that there is an infinite God who created us in his image and calls us into an intimate relationship with him. Our reason for existence from the biblical answer comes from two sources, who we are created to be and what he has called us to do. That's it. That's what, that's, that is our purpose. All of our purpose comes from this, who we were created to be and what we've been called to do. I, w I wonder what philosophy or path you've chosen. D do you lean towards detachment from the world? Have you decided that your calling is something that you got to figure out and you got to make it happen on your own? Or if you're open to the possibility that there is one who created you, knows better than you, and, and knows you like you don't know yourself, with a call on your life, a destiny designed and laid out specifically for you to live, then explore with us today the biblical answer. And so if that's true for you, then calling becomes the ultimate why for human life. When Jesus says, come and follow me, we are now living for the greatest reason for existence. And we begin to see our lives as an opportunity to be shaped and molded. And so with this mindset, we can see each day as an adventure to use our God-given gifts for a greater purpose. And so let me ask you, are you satisfied with the way that you're spending your days? Or do you, do you have a deep longing for something more? I mean, if you think about calling as a great season of your life in the past of, of a time when you felt really connected, you may have lost your way. If you feel lost and unsure of who you are or what you're supposed to do, you may be confused. Listen, if this is where you're at, lean in with ears to hear and eyes to see and believe in faith that God will show you everything you need to know. I believe that he will today. I believe some people are gonna get connected to the purposes of God for their lives today, amen? So today, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna look at 1 Timothy 4. And in these verses, Paul is writing to a young church leader named Timothy, but he's also writing to you and me. And so he talks to Timothy about leadership, but not about the way he's leading others. He talks to him about the way he's leading himself, how he's leading his own life. And isn't, isn't that the truth? All leadership starts with self-leadership. Anyone who wants to be great at leading others has to first become great at leading themselves. And so, so let's read these verses together. 1 Timothy 4, verses 15 and 16. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. It's important to know that this letter, as, as well as Titus and Philemon, weren't just significant to the people that received them. Okay? They were important for the early church as a whole, 
but they're also important for us today. You might not think of the church today as the early church. You're like, is this still relevant to us? Okay, but in many ways, we're not that far from it. Do you want to know why? Because there's one reality the church can never escape from the very beginning, whether it's, it's in its first decade or 50 years or 100 years or thousands of years ago. The leadership of the church can never actually get more than one generation away from a fresh experience of God and coming to know him. It can never get more than one generation away of a personal revival. Because you can't be born into a relationship with Jesus. You can be born into a a Christian home. You can be taught Bible stories. You can be told the truths of the Bible and what it teaches, and you can be introduced to Jesus. But no matter how good a parent you are, your kids are still gonna decide for themselves. My toddlers are sinners, okay? They're cute, but they're sinners. In in fact, just the other day, uh, Marcy sent this video to me an, an hour after bedtime. She put them down to bed. You guys wanna see this? This is crazy. Check this out. <gasps> what did you guys do? I didn't do it. She <gasps> did. What is it? Okay, they're wild. Kids do bad things, and we don't have to teach them. It's in their nature. P- people don't have to be taught to rebel. There is something inside of us that pulls us in a direction that isn't always what's best for us, isn't always what's best for others, and doesn't lead to good stuff. Okay, so from an early age, this is a problem that we're born with. No generation evolves beyond having a sinful nature and neither does the church, okay? So hopefully our kids don't make the same mistakes that we did, but either way, that doesn't change the fact that they're still gonna need to experience their own connection, their own personal revival, their own repentance, their own experience with God's grace for themselves. And so in 1 Timothy, we get this picture of the infant church, and they're mostly all new to following Jesus. In those days, they were, they were living in a sea of idolatry. Everyone was worshiping other gods and other things and idols and all this stuff, right? And so they were only one generation removed from their own origins of the ancient religions. And, and so you may not have parents from another religion, or maybe you do. Okay, you may not have been raised in another religion, or maybe you were. But either way, I bet you don't have to look too far to find people in your family or in your family tree that worshiped the American dream. See, we we might not worship other gods, but that doesn't mean that we don't have idols or that we aren't being influenced to buy into the lies or the value systems of our culture. We live in a sea of idols and it encourages us to follow our desires, to be fiercely independent and to do what we wanna do. And if we aren't careful, we can find ourselves worshiping something just because everyone else is. See, Paul's words are relevant because though a lot has changed in the last few thousand years, some things have not because they're baked into the entire human experience. We will all experience a pull to find meaning, purpose, fulfillment, all of these things apart from Jesus. And so every new generation needs a fresh call, a fresh experience, and a fresh revival. I know that's a really big picture perspective, okay, but I think it's an important place for us to start. Because right now, in our time, just as it was for those that Paul was writing to, it starts with me. Not my criticisms or my critiques. No, it starts with me, my beliefs. What do I believe? My actions. What am I doing with my life? My words, what am I saying? with how I'm leading myself, it starts with me. So we're gonna look at three biblical principles for calling, three biblical principles of calling. And the first principle is this, number one, the the entire context of 1 Timothy 4 is the work that Timothy is doing as a leader in the church. Timothy was a young pastor, leader, he was a member of a church. It it wasn't a special outreach that he started or this new type of ministry or, or nonprofit, and those are good things, but no, our context here He's saying, you're called to some things and I'm gonna give you some guidance around how you're supposed to pursue them, some things that you need to know. And so the first thing, number one, is that every calling needs a church. Every calling needs a church. Bottom line, every calling. Whether you're part of this church, another church, 
wherever. You need a church. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have a calling, and that calling needs a church. Now, I know the word calling might sound kind of old school, but it's no less relevant for us as it's been since the beginning. I, I love it. I love, I love how the word calling, it really implies something, okay? Purpose is great. It's like, this is my purpose. It kind of feels a little bit more, though, like you're going to choose something, and it's a good word, too. But calling, it's just so clear that God is calling you, okay? In the garden, God called Adam and Eve, and he gave them a purpose. He told them to name the animals and to rule. In Exodus, God called Moses to be a mouthpiece and to lead his people to freedom. In the Gospels, Jesus called his disciples. He said, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. We don't talk about calling like we used to. We, we talk about discovering your purpose. We talk about finding your fit and we talk about learning your personality and that's all, it is all good stuff. It's helpful, okay? But here's the deal. The problem is when calling is flattened down to a formula. When calling is just a gifts assessment, when it's just a survey, okay, it doesn't leave room for God to guide us beyond our preferences, beyond the things we like, beyond our personalities. It also doesn't give us the conviction to stick through things in hard times. So without a deep sense of calling, your life will lack direction. God has plans for your life, and he has a plan for every season of your life. He has a plan. There are things God is calling us to in our childhood, in your 20s, in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, hey, even in your 90s. If you're still breathing, God is still calling you to things. So God's call for our lives is greater than anything that we would come up with on our own. It's dynamic, it's relentless, you can't ignore it. If you're a follower of Jesus, until you surrender to the call of God in your life, you'll always feel like something is missing. You'll always feel a little unsettled, maybe even lead to a depression. Like you're living the life that you were dealt rather than the one you could have had. Nothing is more fulfilling than answering the call of the creator. The world says, choose what you want to do in your life, make it happen. The word says, commit to God's calling for your life and he'll make it happen. So if you don't answer God's call for your life, you'll always wonder what could have been, what might have been, what would have happened if I, if I went all in. And every calling needs a church. The second thing is this, number two, You have everything you need to do what God has called you to do. That's encouraging. That is encouraging. You have everything you need to do what God has called you to do. In 2 Peter, Peter says that God has given us everything we need to live a godly life. Uh, The moment you decide to follow Jesus, you don't just receive salvation. You receive a whole destiny. And that destiny is bigger than you. It's more than you would dream yourself capable of doing. And I I don't just mean it's a stretch goal, okay? I'm not just meaning big in scope, like, wow, that's an impressive vision. Okay, some people really do have a destiny that solves global problems. I think that's pretty cool. But what's equally as mind-blowing is that God would use us to help a person get free from addiction or to be there for a friend who needs help on a hard day or to give forgiveness in a situation that most would say, "Uh uh-uh, that's unforgivable. Have you noticed that the problems of our planet and our personal lives are actually pretty connected? They have a lot in common. What do they have in common? Well, no matter how big or small, it starts with me. One situation, one day at a time. Both Paul and Peter believe that God has given us everything we need to make a difference in this world to make a difference in our lives and to make a difference in the lives of those around us. You received everything when you came to know Jesus at the moment that you make that decision. You already have everything you need to do what God calls you to do. He goes on to say this, but I want want you to take what you've been given and grow it, develop it, build it, build upon it, and supplement it. Okay, you have everything, it's true, but there there is a flip side to this. See, God gives us everything, but it's often in seed form. In other words, you, you really do have everything, but you need to develop it into its potential. Think about this. Even superheroes need to learn how to use their superpowers, right? The gifts and the resources that God has given to you need to be shaped and developed. Imagine a church that took their gifts seriously and developed them. God's plan A for your life requires a commitment to personal growth because it starts with me. What am I willing to do? What will I sacrifice for? What do I like 
that I'm willing to give up for the things I love. We need more people who are asking these questions. In two weeks, on November 6th, is Vision Sunday. If this is your home church, plan to be there. Prioritize around it. Cancel plans. I don't care. You gotta be here. Because we're about to do some stuff together and you don't want to be like confused, like hearing about it secondhand, like what, what are they talking about? What's going on? No, this is your church. Be there next Sunday. You know, it seems so obvious, but why is it that we often don't get around to actually using our gifts and, and, and fulfilling our calling? Okay, there are two common distractions that I've noticed, two common reasons that we don't get around to it. And the first is we complain. We focus on what we don't have. We make excuses of why we can't fulfill our purpose. Don't wait for what you want. Work with what you've got. The next thing is we compare. We, we, we compare what we have to what other people have. And we think that if we have that, then we could really get in the game. You know, you know God never compares what he creates. Okay? Instead of complaining or comparing, we should believe that we already have what we have. In faith, we should start stepping into the things that God has called us to do. If you're new around here or you haven't gotten plugged into a serving team, it's not hard. We do everything we can to make it easy because we care. We believe in our mission and we need you. We can't do this without you. Imagine a church with 100, 500, 1,000 people that said, it starts with me. Turn to the person next to you and say, put me in, coach. Put me in, coach. Hey, if you're looking to get in the game, we're offering step one, of our fast track class. It's called Welcome to Brave. And this is where you meet our pastors, you hear our story, you get to know us, we get to know you, what we believe, what what our mission is. But then if you continue through the process, in the next few classes, you're gonna discover your calling, things that God's gifted you for, things you were created to do and to be. And then you're invited to start serving others. Many years ago at a summer camp in high school, Jesus called me to serve. I joined a team, I got into a small group, the people that God placed around me on that team and in that small group, they made all the difference because they called me out and they called me up to more. When I say that God has given you everything you need, it's not just the gifts, the time, the resources. No, it's people. If you're a part of this church right now and you don't feel like you're needed and you don't know where to serve or how to make a difference, email me. Email me at serve at brave.church. And I'm giving you that email. It's just easier to organize. But listen, I will personally make sure that you get connected to a way that you can make a difference. That's how seriously we take this. If you're a part of this church and you open up your life to others, you'll find more than you ever imagined. There is a fulfillment that comes from serving that we can't find anywhere else. It's what Jesus modeled. It's what he told us to do. And it's not just to get things done. Okay, don't miss the heart here. It's not just for the church. It's for our heart. It's medicine for our souls. It takes, serving takes the focus off ourselves and puts it on others. I love this quote, Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusaders, now called Crew. He says, the sermon of your life in tough times ministers to people more powerfully than the most eloquent speaker. How is your life pointing people to Jesus? Let your life preach. Even if it's not on a platform, your life may be the only message of love some people hear. So the first thing that we need to understand about calling is that every calling needs a church. That's a foundation, okay? Number two, you have everything you need to do what God has called you to do, aka no excuses, okay? And lastly, look at verse 16. This is what Paul Paul tells Timothy to do. He says, watch your life and doctrine closely persevere in them because if you do you'll save both yourself and your hearers lastly number three a calling that's never been tested can't be trusted a calling that's never been tested can't be trusted i love how paul emphasizes progress here the proof of your calling is seen in progress not a perfect outcome not off the charts results okay But the most important thing to look at if you feel like God has called you to something is, am I making progress towards it? Is there progress in me? Is there progress in other people's lives because of what I'm doing? Uh, One of our practices as a staff, every Monday, we celebrate wins. And it's so encouraging because it's easy to forget 
all the God stuff that's happening around us. There are way more good things happening around here than we could possibly tell you about. It would take the whole morning and I'd never get to teaching, okay? There's so much good stuff that God is doing. So, so when you get together with your brave group or when you get together with your team or a friend uh, over coffee, don't underestimate the power of calling out something great that God is doing in people's lives. The winds around us, they tell us something really important. They tell us, this is how you know that you're doing the stuff you're called to do. This is how you know that you're making a difference. This is how you know that you're where God has called you to be. But even as you start to see progress, there's gonna be testing. And when I, when I think about the testing of my calling, it's been such an unpredictable journey. I never would have imagined that my yes to Jesus would lead in so many different directions. We all have a story of calling, okay? Even if it feels like it's just getting started. Maybe you're here today, and for the first time, it feels like God is calling you to do something. You might even have felt like a lot of people have called you to things, but today's different because it's not someone calling you and asking you, but today, God is calling you. As I was uh, praying for our church, I realized that a huge part of how we see things is shaped by our starting point and our history. So depending on when you came to Brave, you either got a sense of, man, this church, is it even going to make it? <laughs> like there were points where you would have been like, what? We're meeting in people's backyards and people's living rooms. We're setting up at a community center. Like what's going on here? Or you might've come later. You're like, wow, what an incredible facility. Things just keep getting better. You know, they probably have, they probably have enough staff. They probably have enough volunteers. Like what could they possibly need from me? Because you're just looking at your surroundings. Guys, God has blessed our church but we're not even 10 years old and our mindset hasn't changed, okay? It starts with me. Having an established foundation is a good thing. It's a blessing, but God's blessing isn't for our comfort. Maybe the test of your calling that you're facing right now is am I willing to be uncomfortable again? Brave Church, we're still pioneering. Do not miss November 6th. A pioneering mindset to the things that God calls us to is essential for living a called life because God never stops doing new things. He never stops pioneering new churches, new ministries, new movements, new brave groups, like new cities. But what does that look like in your life? In one season for me, it meant hours of, uh, of practicing my guitar, learning new songs to be in the youth worship band and at times having to say no to going out with friends to see a movie or play video games or, or other stuff that would have been fun because I needed to prepare to serve. Then in college, it meant giving up a lot of normal college experience stuff because God called us to plant a church, to reach our friends, people who didn't know Jesus. Then moving up here to the Bay, a couple of my friends and I, you know, we're in our mid-20s. We're living in a house that my parents rented. We're sharing rooms. Like we thought the, the dorm life was over and we're right back in it. And it meant, my parents love that, by the way, but it meant giving up Friday and Saturday nights so often to just do projects like paint the kids' rooms or hang a projector at 2 a.m. because church is tomorrow and this took way longer than we thought it would. <laughs> or crawling under, under this stage to run wires and trying not to get bit by rats and spiders and like, I'm never doing that again. I paid my dues, okay? But it, but it meant not having money to eat out or to go as many places because you know what? Uh, the church couldn't afford to pay me. So I sent missionary support letters to my friends and to family. And that basically means my grandparents funded my life, okay? <laughs> but today, on some days, my sacrifice looks like studying after the kids go to bed instead of watching shows, waking up at 5.30 in the morning on Sundays, getting the kids ready, getting them there, serving all day, then bringing them home, feeding them. They never, for whatever reason, they never want to nap on Sundays when I'm at my most tired and I just want to watch football. So I don't get to watch football. It doesn't matter what season you're in. There's always something to sacrifice for. A calling that's never been tested can't be trusted. And I don't just mean people can't trust you. Look, testing builds self-trust. It builds trust in your calling. When you pay a price, you see that something's a big deal. You see that you really value it. So Brave Church, what are you sacrificing for? There's nothing like a sacrificial act of worship and then seeing the fruit in people's lives and knowing, you know what, because I did this, because I gave something up or because I did that thing that nobody would ever know about or even see that I did, look what happened. 
When was the last time you gave someone a gift or sent them a meal or flowers and, and nobody knew? What, what strength can you leverage to help others? The testing of your calling is all about being faithful with what God puts in your hands. Some of our calling is about what God puts in our heart, right? But some of it is about what God puts in our hands. And it's not about just what's in my heart. It's what, what's in God's heart. And so here's the lesson. If I'm faithful with what God puts in my hands, what he gave me responsibility for, what he clearly has asked me to do, God will also give me what he's put in my heart eventually. If I'm faithful with what he puts in my hands, he'll give me what he put in my heart. I wonder, is there something you feel like you just have to do? What do you feel like you were created for? Or, or you're drawn to being pulled towards? Matthew 6.33 One of my life verses, it says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. Seeking first the kingdom is about being faithful with what God puts in your hand. So what has God put in your hands? What's he trusted you with? Maybe it's not even what you enjoy doing or where you wanna be. It's just where you feel like you're stuck there. Listen, David was faithful in the pasture before he became leader in the palace. He was anointed to be king one day, then back in the fields the next. He had a journey to get to the palace. People people tried to kill him and God kept him waiting. Every calling will be tested. Faithfulness isn't proven when it's easy to be faithful, when everything's going your way, when life is up and to the right, you don't actually know if you're a faithful person. That's like saying, "I'm, I'm a really fast runner. Well, how fast are you? How fast is your mile? Until you time yourself, you don't know. Like like training, running miles, timing your speed. Listen, the things that test us in each season of our lives are markers that show us, yeah, I'm growing in faithfulness. And Paul says the thing that you need to look for through it all is progress, not perfection, progress. Is, Is there Jesus progress in people's lives because of what you're putting your hands to? And so as we close, let me ask you something. What's testing your faithfulness? What has Jesus called you to? that you're just not making time for, you're not sure you can do it, or you don't feel like you have, you've got excuses, or you don't have the resources for, or whatever. Is it an excuse? Like, oh, I'm just too busy. Well, my kids are older, then I'll have more time. No, you won't. Is it a comparison? Oh, when, when I'm as talented as that person, then I'll join the team? No, you won't. Is it pride? Oh, oh someone else can do that. I'm more gifted for this. When they discover me, you know, when I get discovered and I'm, and they see what I'm really good at, then I'll help out. No, you won't. It starts with me. If you won't start today, you won't start tomorrow. Priest and author uh, Henry Nouwen, I I love this. He says, uh, he was talking about Jesus's ministry. And this is what he said. He said, in the midst of a busy schedule of activities, healing suffering people, casting out devils, responding to impatient disciples, traveling from town to town and preaching from synagogue, to synagogue, we find these quiet words. In the morning, long before dawn, he got up and left the house and went off to a lonely place and prayed there. The more I read this nearly silent sentence locked in between the loud words of action, the more I have the sense that the secret of Jesus's ministry is hidden in that lonely place where he went to pray, early in the morning, long before dawn. In the lonely place, Jesus finds the courage to follow God's will and not his own, to speak God's words and not his own, to do God's work and not his own. It is in the lonely place where Jesus enters intimacy with the Father that his ministry is born. The first thing that Jesus calls us to is himself. Before he asks us to serve, before he asks us to sacrifice, before he asks us to do anything, He calls us to himself. What makes a calling sacred? It's not the work. It's why you do it. It's who it's for. Can I pray for you? God, I pray for each person here today, Lord. I pray that they would catch a vision of a life that is overflowing with your presence and poured out to serve many, to meet needs, to, to, to get beyond ourselves, to see the people around us. God, I thank you for the privilege of being placed here in the Bay Area for such a time as this. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thanks so much for joining us today and listening to today's teaching. We really hope this message has impacted your life. Now, if you'd like more information about who we are, you can visit us at brave.church. There, you're gonna find more information about our on-campus gatherings, our upcoming events, and ways to give and partner with what God is doing through our church. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the like button on this message. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope to see you next time.